and um, welcome to you all. And uh, a good morning or evening, actually, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you very much for joining us today. So, as you all know, normally this annual alumni event would be held in college. And unfortunately, for reasons we all know, this isn't possible today. But the one silver lining is that we're able to invite many more alumni from all over the world to join us and all from the comfort of your own homes. So um, as a reminder, every Watermite is automatically a member of the Alumni Society, and we're especially pleased to welcome this year's graduates to join us. You all deserve particular congratulations for such an impressive set of results in what are really unique circumstances. And as you settle into life in the real world, please do stay in touch with college and with each other. Uh, and I do believe that joining the Alumni Society events is a great way to do this. So enough from me, I'll hand over to the warden to introduce this evening's exciting event now illustrious speakers. Okay, well, thanks, Achin, and thanks very much for that. And thanks for your work as president of the um, Modern Society. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Sachin has said, one of the advantages of doing it this way is that we can bring lots of people together from around the world who might not, not otherwise be able to make it to college. And we've had a, a number of these events now over the, over the last few months, and I'm sure we'll be having a few more. And we may continue them even once the pandemic um, is over because it's such a good way to keep in touch um, with you all. Well, we've got a very topical and um, fascinating um, event this evening, which is focused on US politics and the US election. Um, I think every time there's an election, the protagonists say this is the most important election in a generation. They, they do always say that, but this time, uh, I think most of us can agree that the US election is a particularly um, significant one and an important one. And I think the result of the election is going to affect um, world politics in a significant way um, for some years to come. So it's a topic of huge interest on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and we've got two fantastic guests um, to speak uh, tonight about this. Both are going to give a brief in in introduction and then we're going to, um, at an early stage in the proceedings, throw it open to the floor for questions because I think that's usually a uh, a, a very vibrant part of these events. Um, do all get involved yourselves. Let me just briefly introduce uh, our, our two guests this this evening. Um, both uh, alums. Uh, James Warlock is managing director of an international law firm in Washington. Igorov, uh, Pajinsky, Afansiev, and partners. And he also serves as president and CEO of Juno Global Strategies uh, in DC. And he's a senior advisor to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, James uh, was a career diplomat um, with the United States Department of State for more than 30 years, as well as simultaneously holding down a post as an associate professor of law at Arizona University. And he, uh, one of his posts was as United States ambassador to Bulgaria. He's one of the US's foremost negotiators on defense and security policy issues. We're very glad to have you um, tonight, Jim, and it's a privilege to have you. Lisa uh, Muscatine is a dear friend of the college who's done many events for us over the years, both uh, in Wadham, um, online, and uh, at her famous bookshop, um, Politics and Prose, in Washington. Um, Lisa is a former chief speechwriter to Hillary Clinton at the White House and a senior advisor to her and also at the State Department and served as an informal advisor to uh, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns. She introduced me to Hillary um, a year or so ago in Wadham, which I must say was an enormous privilege and a, a, a great pleasure to, to meet Hillary Clinton. Um, Lissa is currently co-owner of Politics and Prose, which is a, a very famous, uh, not just bookstore in Washington, but uh, site of many fascinating and energizing events uh, centered really on, on politics generally. Uh, and she's presently working on a book, Hillary Land, which is going to be published by Penguin Press. So we couldn't have two better speakers to introduce this topic to us. And I'm very grateful to both of you. Thank you, Lissa, for being here. Thank you, Jim. I think Lissa is going to speak first for five minutes or so, just giving a brief overview. Um, Jim is, then go is going to give a, a, say a few words. Um, we may converse together uh, for a couple of minutes and then we'll throw it open um, to the floor. You can also ask questions if you want to um, on the chat function and I'll pick some of those up uh, later as the evening progresses. 
But Alyssa, can I ask you to start, please? No, thank absolutely. And, and thank you, Ken, for such a lovely introduction. And uh, thank you, Sachin, and all of the Alumni Association for uh, this opportunity. Thank you all for joining in. I, I hear it's a beautiful day in London, and you could easily be out in your garden. So uh, we appreciate that you're foregoing that uh, for an hour to talk about uh, American politics. Um, I just want to thank the whole team at Wadham, Julie, and Marco, and others who helped make this event possible. And, and Jim Warlock, my my former classmate at Wadham, um, it's so great to see you. I'll be, we're in the same place, but we can't see each other because we're also on Zoom for obvious reasons. Um, it's really nice to reunite with you um, for, this, for this event. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. We were joking beforehand that it was gonna be really fun. And then we thought, well, maybe it's actually gonna be really depressing. Um, so we'll do our best to make it more fun than depressing, but of course uh, that may be impossible. Um, I just wanted to start by echoing what, what Ken just said, which is that every election cycle, we hear the same thing, oh, this is the most important election in American history. Um, but like he said, that is really true this time. It, it's really hard to uh, convey, at least if you're somebody like me, who's a Democrat and a progressive, um, the incalculable damage that four years of Donald Trump in the presidency have, have done on this country. Um, you know, it, his presidency has undermined our sense of who we are as a nation and what we stand for, our standing in the world, as I'm sure you all know there. Um, and so we really do face a presidential election this year in which uh, American democracy and, and actually the viability of our institutions are both on the line. And, you know, I don't want to be hyperbolic. We, we are not in a full-blown tyranny yet, but we certainly see the manifestations building around us. Um, and they don't let up. One is obviously cronyism over expertise in government. Uh, the, one of the most alarming is the silence and complicity of the Republican Party in enabling Trump's assault on the rule of law and democratic norms. We see this horrific e economic gap getting wider with COVID and other issues. Uh, we see the sort of appropriation of social media and even a major news network, which is really in effect the first state propaganda network we've ever had that is propagating misinformation and even conspiracy theories, confusing people. And then, you know, as we know from uh, four years ago, the willingness of a president to accept political help from known adversaries. And I just outlined all of those things and that's not even taking into consideration COVID, uh, George Floyd, um, and half of our country going up in flames and smoke right now, uh, most likely due to climate change. Um, and I realize I've said all this, but what you really want to know is who is going to win this election. And I would, I think I'm okay in saying that neither Jim nor I is silly enough to predict the outcome with any certainty. But I will say one thing that I feel strongly about, and that is that absent voter suppression and foreign interference, I am confident Joe Biden and Kamala Harris would win. Um, there are a few reasons for this. We've seen very little movement in the polls nationally or more importantly in the key battleground states since the Republican convention uh, last month. And that's, you know, even factoring in Trump's relentless fear mongering about law and order, his lying about the pandemic and his utter indifference to racial injustice and with all the free media he gets as president. Uh, I think Biden does have some clear advantages over Hillary Clinton four years ago. First of all, we've now experienced four years of Trump, um, which you, in my view, you would think that nobody could possibly vote for him after what we've witnessed, but apparently about 40 to 43, 4% of America still will vote for him. Uh, another sign for Biden that's good is he is incredibly outraising Trump in the money race, which is just shocking for a Democrat not just to be beating a Republican, but by the magnitude, um, he raised $364 million in August alone, and that was compared to $210 million for Trump. It's just, it, it, if you follow American politics, that is an astounding indication of voter engagement. Uh, just by example, um, this just a few days ago, I was on a, a sort of a grassroots fundraising event on Zoom with uh, Hillary and Kamala Harris. Um, they had 100,000 people on that call. They raised $6 million for a one hour call. So that tells you something. Uh, voter engagement clearly is at a peak. The other thing that I think that Biden has going for him is that, you know, Trump is really out of step with public opinion. He has his rabid followers, but the vast majority of Americans are very unhappy with the way the country has dealt with the pandemic 
at the federal level. Most people believe in wearing masks. Most people support Black Lives Matter and the quest for racial injustice and the protest. And I think most people believe that climate change is a urgent global problem and we see the West Coast going up in flames. It reinforces that. So what are Trump's advantages? Based on what I've just said, you'd think, well, there's no way Biden can lose. Well, Trump does have advantages. Um, the economy, mystifyingly remains one of his advantages. I do not understand how people who are getting, uh, forgive my uh, crude language, but screwed by him economically and by his policies are still in the belief that he is better for the economy, but a slight majority of Americans do believe that. He also may have an advantage uh, in election day voting. He, because they don't have a lot of money, they've been pulling ads, uh, now, but he's encouraging his voters to vote in person. Um, and they will, I'm sure, spend a lot of their money or what's left of it at the end of October on advertising to get his voters to the polls. As we know, sadly, he has a federal bureaucracy, particularly the Department of Justice, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the State Department that essentially act now as his personal fiefdoms. And then, of course, he is not at all concerned about lying or fear mongering, which you know is a tactic that at least rallies and energizes his base, if it, even if it doesn't uh, attract swing voters. So I guess just uh, the last couple of points I'll make before turning it over to Jim is, uh, you know, I never in a million years, and certainly not even a year ago, thought I would ever say this. But I'm going to say it because I believe it now. I do think Joe Biden may be the man for the moment. I really do think he might be. Obviously, the debates in a couple of weeks are going to be decisive. But the truth is there are very few undecided voters at this point, And so much of this victory will depend on turnout. Um, there are a lot of advantages for the Democrats in that. But the Republican Party controls more state governments. And they are working overtime to suppress the vote. We know that from Trump's efforts to undermine the Postal Service and to uh, attack mail-in voting. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's, if it's a fair election, as I said, if people are allowed to vote, I think Biden and Harris win without a doubt. But I think there's so many other caveats and concerns that I would not make that prediction right now with, with a great degree of confidence. Um, but I am, I'll, when Jim is talking, I'll get back to praying for a good outcome. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. That's, that's really interesting. Jim. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm so glad to be back in college, even if it's only virtually. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to be on the same program, of course, with the warden and my old friend, Lissa. And it uh, doesn't feel so long ago, but it's been a while since we sat together in the middle common room and mm -hmm. drank coffee together and talked about the world. And so it's a pleasure to be able to talk about the world again with all of you. Uh, of course, the challenge for us is that you all follow CNN and the news closely is to get beyond the headlines. So what I thought I would do would be to mention a few areas of concern. Um, as a former American diplomat, um, I take some pride in being nonpartisan and serving uh, every administration. Uh, I have to say that it's been difficult uh, for myself and for many of my colleagues and former colleagues in this administration. And I want to come back to that. But first, I want to talk a little bit about just why we need to worry about uh, the outcome of, 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 of this uh, election, particularly if you're a, a Biden-Harris supporter. Um, from inside the Beltway, uh, from Washington, D.C. or, or uh, New York City, it certainly seems like Biden and Harris have everything going for them, including uh, strong poll numbers from around the country. But that doesn't necessarily reflect the results of uh, election. And I'd just like to mention three, three issues in particular that you should keep an eye on. The first, and these are all these are these are all coming directly from President Trump. The first is the first is law and order. Um, believe me that there are people in the United States, and not in Washington D.C., that are extremely concerned about what's happening around the United States. 
Uh, it has to do with the police. It has to do with law and order in, in cities. Uh, from Washington, D.C., it doesn't say, seem like that serious an issue. But the president is making it a serious one and, and saying that a Biden administration would result in chaos. And those are his words uh, uh, around the country. And you've perhaps heard him talk about you know, chaos in, in the suburbs, that you're no longer safe. It seems like a silly argument, doesn't it? But um, my family is in Wisconsin and uh, they're good Democrats. They have been uh, union members, God-fearing. Uh, they wouldn't have admitted before the election, but I think that they voted uh, for Trump. And they are concerned about what they're seeing in the country uh, today. And I don't think that they're alone. And remember that it's, it's not Washington, D.C. and New York City that's going to elect the president. Uh, it's going to be those voters in the swing states like Wisconsin or Michigan or Indiana or Pennsylvania. Those, those are the areas where there are these conservatives, some of them like my family who have voted Democrat for their, their lives but are not so sure now where this law and order argument does resonate. The second issue I would mention too is this, what Trump has called uh, the radical left, that somehow extremists have taken over the Democratic Party. Well, I think all of you think that that argument is, 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 is not a valid one because it doesn't take much to look around at uh, people who are very reasonable that like Lisa, who uh, are really speaking uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, a democratic party that represents the majority of, of, uh, of Americans. But there is this concern and it's fed by President Trump that uh, a vote for Joe Biden, even if he is not himself a radical, that others will be behind him and this radical left will be taking control, not just of the Democratic Party, not just uh, uh, our legislative branch, but their agenda will drive the American agenda. And if you're looking for a more uh, sophisticated uh, argument than you hear from President uh, Trump on Fox News, uh, you only have to go to the Washington Post yesterday where uh, uh, a conservative academic, uh, Danielle Pletka, wrote about this very issue and her concerns, and she comes at this uh, as a never Trumper. The third issue I'd mention to you is uh, the issue of, of, of fraud and absentee voting. Well, any of us who follow the news know that this has never been a problem in our, our, our history that uh, absentee voting uh, has not resulted in fraud. And the numbers are startling, dramatically less than 1% of, of, of fraud. But that's not the way the president is portraying it. And there's a danger, actually, on election night. Um, there is the assumption, at least, and I think the likelihood that many, if not most, of the absentee voters will be uh, voting uh, Democratic. It is very possible that uh, in a close election, that on election night, President Trump could come out and say that he has pre prevailed, that uh, he declares victory and asks for uh, Biden to uh, step aside. In the meanwhile, and I think this is an election year where many people will be voting absentee, those ballots have not yet been counted. And what will that mean in terms of, of, of uh, election uh, results, especially if the president were to take uh, a hard position that he in fact has won this election and that any absentee ballots that are coming through would be fraudulent. Uh, my final word will be as a former diplomat, 
And um, I, I, I uh, Ken asked me to mention something about uh, the State Department and our foreign policy uh, apparatus. And, and, and uh, uh, I'm concerned uh, about what has happened over the last uh, four years. Whatever your position may be on our, our foreign, foreign policy, what has happened uh, in the State Department where I worked is that there have been an extremely high number of resignations, including my own, uh, at the beginning of the administration. Uh, there are a high number of positions, not just in the State Department, but around our, our foreign uh, policy establishment that remain uh, vacant and filled with acting uh, uh, officials, some of whom would find it very difficult to be confirmed by the uh, U.S. Senate, even a Republican uh, U.S. Senate. And there's also a policy process. Uh, uh, when I was in government and for more than 30 years that I worked at the State Department, uh, there was uh, a process where decisions were brought to the White House and to the president uh, in uh, a matter that in a manner that presented uh, options and weighed advantages and disadvantages. And since the very beginning of this administration, uh, there hasn't been that interagency process, a process that has taken advantage of the expertise in the foreign policy establishment. Um, I know this is not a discussion on foreign policy, but the next administration, uh, will surely have extraordinary challenges in, in, in that regard. And, and as a former diplomat, I uh, hope to see that process um, of, of uh, uh, relying on um, the uh, establishment in a way that does present uh, uh, options to decision makers. I hope to see that that will, that will, will be uh, working uh, Again, so with that, I'll, I'll I'll stop, and I look forward to our discussion and, and the, the, the questions. Thank you, Jim. Um, that's very sobering. A very sobering presentation, um, both parts of it, both the, the foreign policy part and the election part. I'm just going to ask each of you one question arising out of out of all of this. Um, first, for you, Lissa, and and in, in a sense, what Jim has done is portrayed every liberal's nightmare about what's actually going on in the States and, and, and what could be the electoral result of that. I'm just, I just wanted to ask you one thing, which is that we keep hearing about shy Trumpers and the polls and, um, and, and the extent to which shy Trumpers may be distorting the polls or the polls may not be getting to the people who are gonna vote for Trump for a variety of reasons. The pollsters are now saying, oh, no, no, we've learned our lessons from 2016. We now get to the, we get to the Trump voters, you know, we're not, we're not, there's no shy Trumper effect this time. There won't be. Do, do you buy that? I do think the polling is better, and I do think they learned some lessons, but polling is in, you know, it's, it's an art as much as a science, so you can never be absolutely sure. But let's not forget, you know, the perception is that the polling was way off last time. It wasn't way off. It was within the margin of error. So, you know, they weren't that far off saying that Hillary would win. They just, the mar you know, it, was the, it ended up being a, a question of the margin switching. Um, I do, I'm sure there are Trump people who are embarrassed to say to a polling person that they're going to vote for Trump. I, I think the most important thing with polling is always to look at likely voters, not registered voters. Um, or not just random people. If, if you look at likely voters, Biden's maintain is Biden's lead is holding up in almost all of the swing states. I mean, he's ahead in the swing states that Trump won. Again, I don't think it's going to come down to swing voters. I think it's going to be about turnout. There are more Democrats than Republicans. Independents have shifted away from Trump. Suburban women have shifted away from Trump. Suburban white women. Um, and older people in key states like Florida have shifted away from Trump, at least enough, it seems, if Biden can maintain it, to help give Biden the victory. Um, but, you know, there's always that outlier. Uh, I, you know, you can, you, can, you can cast it a lot of different ways, Ken. There, there are also a, a lot of stories about 
Uh, you know, the people who voted for Trump thinking, oh, Hillary's going to win anyway, but I don't like her. I'm just going to vote for him and give him a chance. He's something different, who now are like, oh, my God, what did I do? Um, and then there are the, the, the uh, people like uh, the, the, the woman from the American Enterprise Institute that Jim referenced, uh, who wrote yesterday in the Washington Post about how she's just so worried about a leftward tilt of the Democratic Party under Biden because Biden is old. And you know, but the idea that they can succeed in portraying Kamala Harris as a radical or some of the other people around him, and it, it, it's, it's preposterous. And I'm actually, frankly, shocked that a woman of that intelligence and and background could fall for that. I mean, it just seems odd to me. I don't know her, but um, so I don't know. I mean, yes, there probably will be covert Trump supporters. Will they be enough to tip an election? I, I'm doubtful. Okay, Jim, Sorry. just 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 one question for you before we we open it up, um, and it's on this question of mail-in voting. So it sounds as though a lot of the Republican leadership in Congress are tearing their hair out at this this. Um, policy that Trump's pursuing of trashing mail-in voting because they fear it's going to suppress the Republican mail-in vote. And that overall, although more of his people are likely to vote in person, if the mail-in vote is suppressed, that will damage his prospects and indeed their prospects in the, in the Senate and congressional races. Do you think there's any force in that? They seem to be concerned about it. Um, let me first come back to a few things that Lisa, Lisa said before we talk about mail-in voting. I frankly am worried. Uh, I think that what uh, the, the danger that we're going to see, we know that uh, Trump supporters are going to come out. Uh, they are, his base is as strong as, as, as ever. And we've seen over the last four years that he can maintain that base of 40%, 40 plus uh, or minus. And there is no question if Democrats turn out at, at the polls, Biden and Harris will win, but are they going to turn out? And don't forget, we have this, this the, the COVID factor. Are they going to take the time to send in their absentee ballots? Are they going to take the risk to go out and, and go to their local uh, polling uh, place? If they do, I agree with Liz, that I think that there will be a Biden-Harris victory. The numbers are, 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 are there for them. My concern is, if they don't turn out, and especially in the swing states where there are committed Republican voters, that they will turn, they will turn out, and they will not be deterred uh, by uh, COVID. And could that make the difference uh, in the uh, election? And I'm not so sure about the polls. Uh, yes, within a margin of error four years uh, ago, but. I think it raised suspicions among all of us. Are there those those those, those voters uh, out there? You know, on the law and order argument that I that that I made, uh, we you know we can look back uh, uh, in history, in particular to Richard Nixon, uh, who, if you recall, was elected twice on the law and order platform, and he talked about the silent majority, and you know, at the time, it certainly seemed that that. You know, his rival that first time was Hubert Humphrey had an enormous degree of support. Uh, in fact, there was a silent majority out there and they did turn out and they, they, they voted for him. I think on absentee uh, 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 voting, you know, I, 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 I think that what we're hearing in the media is uh, correct. I think the numbers are going to be high. I think that there will be uh, higher percentage of Democrats than Republicans who turn out. Um, I, I, while I don't believe that outright fraud is likely, I do think that this is an enormous challenge for our postal system, that if there is a high turnout and, and these ballots in the millions need to come in, and, and, and be counted. It starts with our postal system being able to do its job, and then a method of counting them and those kinds of numbers that will take time. And uh, how would President Trump use that time between yeah. election night and when we truly see the results, which is not likely to be the next day. It's likely to, to be uh, some days, if not longer. 
well, it's a night, it's a nightmarish prospect, frankly. And I think what one one thing that one one can say with confidence is that he'll use the time to behave badly, and what the consequence of that will be is another matter. Okay, I think we'd better now throw this open to the audience. Um, when you when you speak before you speak, could you just in, introduce yourself and tell us when you were at Wadham and, and what subject you studied? Um, and the first question is from Lynn Davis. Lynn, are you with us? Make sure you're not muted. You're, you're muted at the moment. Unmute. Wonderful. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Great. Okay, so um, I was, uh, uh, matriculated autumn in 1987 in biochemistry, and I currently run a national partnership um, which is focused on cancer research internationally. Okay. And we're looking at trying to act up all of the cancer research organisations internationally that fund cancer research and encourage them to work together um, to ensure that we're you know, making the best possible um, outcome for cancer research patients internationally. So I was really interested by the discussion here and um, wondered whether any of those speakers had insight in terms of what they felt going to be um, interesting or a potential um, outcome for research in uh, Donald Trump's campaign. So Joe Biden, as we all know, has been very supportive of the moonshots in cancer research and Donald Trump has not been. So do you feel that there's, a, you know, is science going to be a significant marker in the coming election or not? So what, what's, the, what's the role that the candidates take on science and the importance of science? What role is that likely to have in this election in terms of... Well, the Scientific American a magazine, for the first time in its history... I saw that. ...has endorsed Biden for president on the basis of Trump's complete complete uh, disregard for science and expertise and impartial facts and evidence in the use of both research and also, you know, analysis and everything else, as we know, we know it from a lot of different ways, but we certainly have seen it with the pandemic. So, uh, you know, the, I'm sure the vast majority of the scientific and medical communities um, are supporting Biden for that reason. Biden, of course, is also believes in climate change and Trump is a climate denier, even in the midst of uh, the West Coast burning to smithereens, um, you know, and and the you know first sign of that, of course, was Trump's his initial and continuing assault on the Affordable Care Act, uh, even during a pandemic. So I think there's no doubt that that is one of the biggest differences between the two of them. Um, I, can I just add one quick thing to what Jim was saying before about the turnout? I want to just point out that in 2016 there was a third party candidate, Jill Stein, who actually did some damage to Hillary Clinton and turnout was incredibly low. Hillary did not generate a lot of enthusiasm. This time, if you look at, if you're interested in assessing or trying to predict turnout, one of the things you look at is voter engagement since the last presidential election in the cycle. Usually it goes way down after a presidential election, not to come back up really till the next one. And what pollsters are seeing is massive voter engagement remaining at almost presidential levels this entire uh, four years. And we've seen that in the 2018 election turnouts, which of course propelled this huge uh, Democratic victories in the in Congress. Um, and we've seen it in a lot of the primaries this year and in special elections, including in some of the um, swing states. So I think there are certain constituencies that may not, you know, that typically don't vote in great numbers like young people, but there are other constituencies that seem highly, highly motivated. And I think that uh, is something that at least gives me hope. Okay. Can I just, I should have said this earlier, if people want to ask a question, it's very helpful if they use the raise the hand function. You can find that by clicking on participants at the bottom of the screen and then when the names come up, if you click your hand, then it's easier for us to, to, to see who wants to ask a question. Um, Fred Riz has got a question, um, which is this, if you had a magic wand with which you could either flip the White House or flip the Senate, but not both, which would you choose and why? Jim. Uh, if only, right? Um, no, I think that, that this is a, 
a unique situation in American history where uh, a president has inordinate influence uh, uh, on, uh, on his uh, party and on politics. Uh, in my lifetime, I've never seen a president who's truly taken over their party, uh, Republican or Democrat, the way that Trump has, has done. In fact, uh, if Trump is defeated in this election, the Republican Party will have to do some serious soul searching about what they are. Who are they? Because they are not the party uh, that you know we remember from more than four year, years uh, ago. And you can go down that long list of issues uh, where uh, the Trump uh, 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 imprimatur has taken the party by storm. And you can see that, that even within the party, he really has no rivals. Uh, once he disappears from uh, the scene, uh, whether it's soon or whether it's four years from now, who does that leave in the, uh, in the party to define the future? And uh, it's, uh, it's problematic. So my short answer is the White House. Okay. Lisa, which would you flip, the White House or, or the Senate? And with Jim, I would flip the White House, and I agree. I mean, the, the, just in terms of executive orders, which a president can initiate on his own um, without Congress, you know, Trump has done incalculable damage uh, uh, just through executive orders, you know, be it on choice, be it on climate change, be it on, you know, nuclear deals, be it on all sorts of things. And so a president uh, like Biden elected with executive orders could at least uh, begin to reverse some of that. In terms of the Republican Party, uh, I do think that Trumpism is going to survive beyond Trump, sadly, and I think it's going to sadly, even more shockingly and terrifyingly, be in the personages of Donald, of Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump, who are clearly positioning themselves to take the mantle from their father. Um, they, too, have developed a sort of rabid following. Um, but the problem for the Republican Party for Trumpists or non-Trumpists is that Demographically, they are becoming a very shrinking slice of the American population. The American population is becoming more diverse, more urban, younger, more multicultural, more multi-religious, um, more tolerant of uh, sexual preference and all these things. And that does not bode well for a party that is essentially the party of white males and white women who um, go along with them. And so I just don't see the future of Trumpism along that lines unless you control the levers of government the way he has and hollow out government such that it becomes your personal mechanism of political machinery. Yeah. Uh, Duncan, Duncan Enright. Uh, hello, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Um, I have two um, Duncan, do you want to tell us, one? Duncan, do you want to tell us when you, when you matriculated? Oh, yes, sorry, 1982 physics. And okay. uh, um, yes, one is a, a question about um, the political parties. I wonder if you could dig a bit deeper into why it is that the Republican Party has collapsed into Trumpism so completely. And I speak as a, a Labour Party moderate member who, whose party has been through a, a, a change of a similar nature recently. Um, and the other thing is, um, if Trump launches the COVID vaccine and declares victory in October, what happens then? Lisa, do you want to take that first? Um, okay, I'll try. I mean, Trumpism, you know, it, it, it's a reaction. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's, it's not a cause. It's a reaction that's been building since the 1980s with Reagan. Um, when, uh, I mean, Reagan was not, you know, crazy like Trump is for sure. And he obviously, has a huge uh, popular following. But um, the Republican Party really gained a lot of steam then. And the Republican Party started in 1964 with the Johnson-Goldwater election to retool itself. And what it did was a, 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 some very, very, very wealthy philanthropists who are very conservative uh, right-wing philanthropists uh, really got together and decided to begin financing uh, different ways of cultivating Republican support, be it in state governments and local governments, in law schools, in, in uh, the media. So there were suddenly, you know, radio stations that had a, a bent. There were uh, law schools where uh, endowed chairs for more conservative faculty were, were put in. And it took about 40 years, but it really worked. And so 
the Republican Party philosophy got disseminated and diffused throughout a lot of institutions in the American sort of political ecosystem. Um, and then Trump just appropriated it with, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think he was really helped by running against 15 people in the primary who divided the sort of normal moderate Republicans in the last election cycle. And he was the outlier and he was entertaining and he had, you know, he had used The Apprentice and his, his social media and a lot of his um, sort of uh, personality things to uh, get people interested in him and to engage him. And he's a master marketer. And that's essentially how he got in. I think people in his party were shocked. And then because he absolutely does not subscribe to any political norms, I think his party was afraid of him. And so the Mitch McConnells of the world decided it was better to go along with him to go against him because then he'd sick his, you know, rabid followers on you through social media. And believe me, a lot of people have suffered from that. Look at the people who have challenged him in government, you know, who get trolled and harassed and have death threats, including members of his own administration who leave or, or disagree with him. So it's kind of, you know, it's bully tactics and it works. And so I think that's the quick explanation. Okay. I would add to that. You know, the Republican Party really lacks leadership. Uh, who, who is who is there? I mean, they, they, they tried, you know, Rubio, Cruz, others four years ago. Who is it that's young that's going to speak for the for for the party? There are some people out there, Tom Cotton from uh, Arkansas, extreme conservative. Uh, I don't believe that he represents the, the future. Uh, ben Sass from Nebraska. Uh, there are people who are out there, but the question is, uh, for now, at least, Trump's taken all of the air out of the room. There's, there's not space for uh, a, a leaders to uh, emerge that uh, could be a, a appealing to a broader cross section of the American uh, public. You know, and in, in, in with regard, um, Duncan, to your, to your, the second part of your question. You know, if I wouldn't be surprised if there is an announcement about a, a, a vaccine a vaccine and uh, um, on the eve of the uh, election. But I think you've got to give the American voter a little more credit. Um, I, I, I don't believe that, that Americans are, are, are going to stand up and, and, and applaud uh, Trump as the, the savior because he can make that announcement uh, days or weeks before uh, uh, the, the, the election. I think, if anything, people are going to be cautious and careful uh, that vaccine whenever okay. it comes, comes through. Okay. Um, Jane Wannacott, have you got a, you've got a question, I think. Sorry, I don't. That was a mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. um, Graham Coles. Hi, Modern History in 1975. I'd like to know, sharing the concerns about the prospects of four more years of Trump, what is it that the Democrat Party sees in Trump that makes it think that the person to beat him is Biden? Okay, well, that's going straight to that. It? Now, it's interesting because, Lisa, a moment ago, you said that you'd never thought you'd say this, but now you begin to think he might be the man of the moment. I've heard a lot of people say that, that, that somehow he has, for whatever reason, turned out to be the right person to take on this battle. Do you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, I, mean, I think if you look at the, the constituencies that the Democrats have to win, one of them being the white working class, Biden is a really good messenger to that group. Um, he is from that uh, cohort himself. Um, sure, he's been in Washington for a long time, but he really, you know, his big thing is how he's empathetic and he identifies and he's been through a lot of adversity, as I'm sure all of you know himself, and is quite moving uh, when he speaks about it. You know, he's often... Uh, chided and of course Trump is trying to make him into some senile doddering crazy person and I have to admit when he was about to give his campaigns his uh, convention speech you know I think I like zillions of Democrats across the country were just hoping he didn't do something embarrassing but you know he he also has had a lifelong stutter and I do think some of his verbal gaffes and slip-ups are related to stumbling over words actually because of that that um, disability. And so he does, though, have a kind of humanness and a em em empathy and compassion um, that I think a lot of people are looking for because they are exhausted by Trump's 
hatefulness, his, his desire to divide, his lack of empathy, his lack of compassion. Um, and so to me, he's sort of the exact antithesis of Trump. Um, and I think that's a good thing. You know, there are a lot of people, not a lot of voters who will be voting against Trump, but without enthusiasm, not for uh, Biden, because they're enthusiastic about who Biden is and, and, and what he stands for. And I agree with Liz, uh, you know, people are tired. Uh, a lot of people are, are tired at the way that they have seen uh, America run over the last uh, four years. And you compound that with uh, the troubles that we've had in 2020. And uh, um, I, I, I think that Biden can, can capitalize. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. So can I just ask you this, Jim? Who was your favorite Democrat Hello? primary candidate? Are you asking me? Well, I'm asking Jim first, then I, then I was oh, going to ask you. Ahead, um, I was going to come to you. You know, I was, uh, uh, yeah, I've always been a, a strong, uh, I've had a strong feeling for Kamala because uh, um, I, you know, I think that uh, she has an awful lot to offer uh, for the Democratic uh, uh, Party. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that she, she would have had the kind of base needed to uh, challenge a strong Republican. Mm. Uh, but she brings an awful lot to the ticket now. Uh, and she was the right choice. And, and uh, uh, I thought for a, a, a long time, her background, and, and not only as a woman of color, but her background is, is, is an impressive one. Uh, okay. So I think she does add today a lot to the ticket. Okay. Lisa, who was your favorite? Yeah, I, I, I've always really liked Kamala Harris. Um, I got to know her a little bit right after she came to the Senate. So I've been in some small gatherings with her, really impressed by her. Um, I love her backgrounds, all the things that Jim said. I think she's adding incredible dynamism and energy to this ticket. Anybody who watched her grill Bill Barr and grill uh, Brett Kavanaugh during the Judiciary Committee hearings knows how tough she is and yet how uh, kind of composed she is, which is great. Um, so I really liked her all along, but I have to say, I got really irritated with people said, oh my God, this democratic field. I thought they were all fabulous. I would have been happy with any of them pretty much. I mean, not Tulsi Gabbard and not, you know, a few of the outliers, but you know, the Pete Buttigieg's and Amy Klobuchar's and Elizabeth Warren's, sure they have ideological differences, but they're very much, uh, you know, motivated by the same things, I think. And so I think we were lucky in that respect. And the fact that Biden ended up getting it was thanks to black voters and Jim Clyburn. That's yeah. really important. That is necessary for a Democrat to win. And it's one of the reasons I'm sure Kamala Harris is on the ticket apart from the fact that she's qualified without that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I really like her. Okay. Hillary Davies. Hillary. Are you, are you muted? Sorry, you've just you've just answered my question. I was going to ask about Kamala Harris. I was, oh, going, okay. to ask, I was okay, going to ask both of you what you what you thought about her. So okay. thank you very much. <laughs> um, Kenneth Woods. Are you there, Kenneth? I think you you may be muted. I'm mute. Hello. 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 Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I would appreciate um, the speaker's comments on two issues. Uh, the first one is that I am totally baffled by the fact that over 40% of the American population um, are still uh, addicted to Trump in spite of all his faults. And I, I, I'd appreciate comments on how this could possibly be. The second thing is, I'm concerned about some of the defects in the American Constitution. It strikes me as ludicrous that when somebody wins a three million majority of the population, that they still lose the election. Mm -hmm. I find it 
very discouraging that in spite of all the faults of the president, there seems to be no way of removing him until the end of four years. So I, I'd appreciate their comments on those aspects mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. I should, say, I should say that Ken speaks as someone who's lived in the States for decades. So he's quite familiar with the American Constitution and American politics. Yes. Lisa. Um, yeah, well, why do 40 to 43 percent of Americans still think Trump is the guy? I mean, I, I'm going to give you a simple but I think accurate answer, which is that, that we now have a state run propaganda machine that is you know, presents itself as a national news network, but is completely an arm of Trump, which is Fox News. And um, if you only watch Fox News, which most of his supporters only watch, you are going to be fed a relentless diet of conspiracy theories, uh, lies, misinformation, and other things about the pandemic, about who the protesters are, about all sorts of things. And there are a few very notable personalities on Fox who have tremendous followings who are uh, very happy to do Donald Trump's uh, handiwork for him, just as Bill Barr is happy to do uh, Donald Trump's handiwork in the Justice Department and, you know, the head of the CDC is willing to, uh, if not falsify, certainly distort data to the public about the pandemic and on and on it goes. So when you have that kind of control of information that is going to about that number of people, it is not surprising that those people believe what they believe about Trump. And the culture of grievance is very powerful. You know, Trump is always the aggrieved party. It's always somebody else's fault. Everybody's picking on him. The fake news is after him, CNN and this and that, and the bullies and the Democrats. And, and if you yourself are experiencing some sort of grievance, it is, I think, energizing to hear somebody else voice it for you. And there is a good reason for a lot of that grievance. I'm not denying that. I think that Biden has to speak to that grievance if he wants to get elected. Um, but Trump has sort of monopolized it as a political messenger for the moment. Um, so that's the first thing. In terms of the electoral college, yes, the Constitution clearly did not anticipate a president who would completely violate norms that are historic in our country, institutional norms. I mean, we just didn't anticipate a president who would act, attack his own federal agencies, who would attack the intelligence community, who would attack uh, the FBI, who would attack uh, experts in science. Um, and so once you start having that kind of corrosive effect and you hollow out government, I mean, the number, and Jim would know this better than I, the number of diplomatic positions that remain open, the number of, of assistant secretary level in our various cabinet agencies that have not been filled, because he doesn't want them filled. He doesn't want experts. He doesn't want people telling him what to do. And, um, you know, so he's got the, he's got controls of the levers of government and the constitution and the founders did not really, I think, adequately uh, anticipate that. And clearly the electoral college is a terribly antiquated, outdated uh, and, uh, you know, unfair system at this point. We've now had two elections in 20 years where the winner, the popular vote winner was not, did not become the president. So you're very right about that. On the point of the Electoral College, you know, this, this will take an amendment to our Constitution, which, as you know, is not easy uh, uh, to do. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's an anachronism. Um, what's going to happen, though, you keep an eye on this, because the demographics in the United States are changing. And right now, you know, there are swing states, and you can argue that there is a reasonable balance. But with demographics, some key states are going to turn Democrat most particularly Texas. So within a decade, Texas turns uh, Democrat. Or the Republicans are going to have a real issue because they're going to find that, that, that their candidate cannot compete against uh, 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 the number of electors that can be turned out from Texas, Florida, New York, California. Uh, so something's going to have to be uh, done, and the uh, Republicans, I, I think, if, if you look down the road that, that decade away with demographics, the Republicans are going to be the ones to, uh, to be uh, talking about change. Okay. Martin Perry. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I was a physics uh, matriculated in 93. 
So my question is kind of following on from the question around, um, around mail-in ballots. Um, and I was listening to a podcast the other day that was talking about um, the fact that if you have like uh, in-day in -day voting, people who actually turn up on the date vote, um, and that all gets counted much quicker than mail-in ballots. You could be in a position where Trump is ahead at like the, by, by the end of the night, and then the other votes would gradually get counted and they're probably more, um, more Democrat, more, more Biden leading. And so you get to a position where eventually Biden would win, but it would look like Trump had won on the night. And, and kind of what that could mean on social media, the implications for the country uh, could, could be a ma massive mess. Talking as a, from massive messes, I'm, I'm in Brazil, so you might <laughs> countries that you can always have a worse um, COVID than the US. So, so, we, we, so we touched on this earlier. I mean, it is, it is quite serious, isn't it? Because he'll say, I've won. All his supporters will be saying, we've won. And then gradually over the next two or three, could be three, four, five days, the results trickle in and, 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 and he hasn't won. But what happens then? Um. You know, it's the big question, right? Everybody knows he will do anything, probably, to try to re retain the office, either before uh, the election or in the aftermath, if it appears he might lose. Uh, what I do know, and this I hope is actually true, and but I, I this is I know this from people in the highest levels of the Biden campaign. They are working extremely hard as we speak, in anticipation of just such a scenario. And they have mobilized huge numbers of lawyers and others to guard against the possibility of Trump trying to call the election too early before the votes are counted, trying to make sure, first of all, that there isn't voter suppression, trying to, uh, but really uh, in anticipation of exactly that scenario. Um, you know, I do have to say the Supreme Court is very divided uh, right now, but I, I believe that if it came to a question of were votes fairly counted, you know, we not notwithstanding the 2000 election outcome, I think John Roberts is an institutionalist. He's the chief justice. He's a conservative, no doubt about it, but he's an institutionalist. And I do think he believes in institutions and their uh, trustworthiness and their viability. And I can't imagine him presiding over an attempt to steal an election. Because he's also particularly sensitive at the moment. We've seen this in the way he's voted with the reputation of the court, isn't he? He, he doesn't want, he, he's got this obvious dread of the court being seen as a Trump court. And he'll, exactly. he'll vote with the liberals when he has to, to stop that. Right. Yeah. I mean, he'll you know, I have great faith in our system that, that this, is, this is going to work out in that, in that uh, scenario. But I am concerned when I see uh, reports, which you may have seen in the news just yesterday, a senior government, uh, official who uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services who came out and, and said uh, that uh, citizens need to arm themselves and have enough ammunition. Now I'm not suggest suggesting you know wide civil unrest but I am concerned uh, 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 about that there are people out there uh, like, like this uh, in the United States and I, 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 I do worry about uh, the, the, the kind of chaos that uh, you know could be created by uh, uh, an extended period where we're not sure and Trump is claiming victory. Yeah. Can well, I, I add one? So yes, please. Add, yeah. One quick thing. You know, we also know that there are a lot of outside agitators using social media on both extremes um, to 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 create disruption. And I think Trump wants that so that he has a reason to, if you know, impose martial law, have the military go on the streets. And I just want to say that there are a lot of uh, law schools right now. Uh, some of the premier law schools in the country have clinics going on right now where they are building arguments against Trump ever invoking the Insurrection Act, which would allow him to mo mobilize the military in the case of civil unrest. And so, um, you know, people are thinking about if he, you know, what do we do if he tries that? Um, and the one, you know, sliver of hope is that uh, when he did his little, you know, dance across Lafayette Square to, with the Bible holding in front of the church and he had the generals with him, 
um, they, you know, they pulled back from that. They got a lot of grief from other military members. The military and Trump are not in the greatest sync right now. And so the idea that he could mobilize the military, I think, is a kind of a fraught idea, I hope. Okay, so we, 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 we really need to draw to a close very soon because it's after seven. I think we've got time for two more, so long as the questions are quite short. So I'm just going to take them in the strict order in which they were, they were asked. So first of all, um, uh, David Levin. Hi there. Um, thanks very much, David Levin, uh, PPE uh, 1980. I uh, live in New York City um, and uh, um, I'm traumatized at the prospect of uh, any, any uh, Trump, Trump subverting and, and taking uh, the next turn. But I want to say um, I'm shocked at the certainty that people uh, have been articulating that there's sort of this idiot center of America which is voting for Trump and somehow they've just been misled by Fox News. Um, I work in Arizona, I work in Texas. Um, uh, these are decent people, they're not um, idiots, and they feel alienated, left behind, and isolated. And I think one of the reasons that the Hillary campaign lost the last election was that sense of just ignoring these folk. Um, so two questions. One is, in this whole debate, we've not used the word economics once, and whoever's, um, it's, it's going to be a consequence rather than a, uh, an, an output of this election is going to be the, the massive economic uh, turn and the second is psychology we've got this massive divide is there any way that the either of the speakers think that it can be healed because it's much more polarized than britain much much more polarized okay so if we have relatively brief i mean those are big questions but if we have relatively brief answers we'll be able to get to one more question um who wants to start jim do you want to start David, I would agree with you, actually, that, uh, you know, I, I do believe that there are a lot of people who are fed up with Washington. Uh, this message of, of, of draining the swamp uh, did have a lot of resonance four years ago and still does with a, a lot of people. I started off my comments saying, you know, I have a uh, family uh, in uh, Wisconsin, and I honestly don't know how they're going to, to, to vote. Uh, and, you know, these are, these are good people. And uh, I started off with the argument about law and order. There are people who are truly concerned when they see what's happening in a place like uh, uh, Portland. These are, you know, good Americans who don't want to see their, their, th that kind of, uh, of, of chaos on the streets. And I, I, you know, I can't say that this is 40 or 45 percent of the population or that he's really going to command that kind of, uh, of, of, of a vote. But you're right, there's a significant portion of the the population who we just don't seem to understand in Washington and, and, and New York, I suppose, who uh, believe in Trump uh, strangely that he is the outsider coming in to drain the swamp and change things. Lisa. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, I will say, first of all, I think I did refer, I tried to refer to the idea that Trump was winning on the economy, and that is an incredibly important issue to people. And also that, uh, and, and I apologize if I was trying to say that people are idiots if, if for watching Fox News, but I do think there is a, a propaganda machine at work that does disseminate misinformation that people then appropriate, not because they're stupid, because that's all they're hearing. And he has tapped into a culture of grievance. And as, as I said earlier, that grievance, which is among the working class, is legitimate, um, as, as is the grievance among poor people in inner cities and people of color all over the place who have a, you know, a, a, a broken system to contend with. So it's de very definitely a, a part of the election. And I think Joe Biden, what I was saying earlier is that I think Joe Biden is actually somebody who can connect to those constituencies in a way that previous Democrats maybe haven't so well. Okay. Thank you. Ali, um, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, 1989, matriculation year, uh, studied law at Wadham. A very quick question in the interest of time. Um, I'll miss the intro to the question. But just saying, I mean, it's, I, I'm, as a follower of American politics for many years, I'm just amazed that, um, at how uh, the Republican Party is allowing Trump to say he won't respect the election, he will challenge it. So is there a point where uh, the, you know, Mitch McConnell's, uh, Lindsey Graham would have the guts to stand up to him and say enough is enough? Because I think the idea 
that an American president, and I, and I come from the Arab world, so I think there's, there, there's the issue of America and other countries being sort of uh, representative of democracy uh, is so important. And, and I just find it uh, amazing that the, I, I think other than Mitt Romney, I can't think of any Republican that's willing to stand up to him and how long will they let it go if he refuses to recognize an election victory for the other side? Lisa. I think part of it depends on what the margin of victory is. If the margin of victory is solid and, and big enough, I think it's going to be hard for them to do that. You know, all politics is local is the saying. Mitch McConnell will, is one of the most opportunistic politicians probably in American history. Um, I think it'll depend a lot on what his own fortunes are going to be, de depending on which way he goes on that. And certainly Lindsey Graham, neither of them has shown any spine to date. Um, obviously, they have a huge amount of self-interest in Trump's re-election. Uh, they will probably support it and try to fight for it for that reason. But if at any point it seems that their futures are uh, less certain, I think they, you know, maybe they'll do the right thing. But they haven't so far. I don't have huge hope. Not to be cynical, uh, but it's all about politics. Uh, uh, certainly, Mitch McConnell sees it that way. Uh, how are Republicans going to be elected? And right now, it's drawing on that 40% uh, uh, Trump base. And with Mitch Mc and, and with Lindsey Graham, he's in the fight of his life. Uh, I think that that uh, months ago, his was a uh, an assured uh, seat in the Senate. It's no longer. Uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's all about what's going to help re-election. I saw a I saw a campaign video from Mitch McConnell's. Um, opponent it was a very effective uh a very effective campaign video it, it, they, they call him rich mitch uh and they were exposing how much money he's made since he moved to washington um and it was quite quite punchy quite a punchy democrat campaign video i'd say well, will you both take sorry let's not forget that his wife is in the cabinet and apparently is enriching herself and her family yeah. through her yeah cabinet. will you both will you will you both take one more just one final question oh yeah sure Okay, so Leila Roberts wants to ask a question. Hi, yes, um, matriculating year 2017, I've just graduated in English. My question is about impeachment. Um, we saw the impeachment inquiry, which began in September 2019, it appeared doomed to fail. I mean, Trump needed to lose 20 senators for it to win, and sure enough, it did fail. So my question is, if Trump does win this time round, um, do you think that we will see another impeachment inquiry, or do you think that the Democratic Party has become more conscious of the way in which it contributes to the hyper-partisanship we're seeing now? Because these, um, these impeachment talks and impeachment talks since Bill Clinton's impeachment, we've seen impeachment talks become way more partisan, we've seen them encourage tribalism, and we've seen them become a part of the permanent campaign which isn't contributed towards a democratic society. In fact, one could say that it erodes trust in democratic institutions. So do you think that the Democratic Party has learned the lessons of their failed impeachment? Interesting question. Well, I would say barring further evidence of, of high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, I don't think that the Democrats are going to bring up uh, impeachment again. I don't think that it is an issue that has much uh, resonance. In fact, uh, it seems like a very, very long time ago that those uh, hearings uh, took place, and they're certainly not an issue um, in the election, certainly not one that the Democrats want to raise. I don't think that they're going to want to revisit that. I think it all depends on who controls the Senate. Um, if the Democrats control the Senate and Trump is reelected and Trump, you know, tries to get uh, foreign governments to intervene in our system and our democracy and and do the things that he did, uh, which are pretty un incontrovertible. Uh, I, I think it is an, a very important mechanism to employ. I do not think it is anti-democratic whatsoever, especially when you have a president who is so willing to assault the institutions that are meant to mitigate executive power um, and denude the other uh, branches of government of their power in order to cement his own power. So it's a, a very, very important instrument in our democracy. I do, I do think it was a legitimate uh, 
impeachment issue this time. It's about foreign interference in a government. It's about a president soliciting help to go after an opponent in an election. That does not happen normally in, you know, advanced democracies. Um, uh, and, you know, in comparison to the Clinton thing, okay, Clinton lied about having sex with an intern. That was a terrible thing to do. It was a disgrace to the president and so on, and perhaps worthy of impeachment as well, but certainly on a very, very different scale in terms of its what it said about the nature of our democracy. So I have to respectfully disagree with you about whether it is important or not to do this. I don't think it's a matter of lessons learned. Um, and I think if there's a democratic Senate and he is reelected and pulls some fast ones like he has already and just shows no allegiance to the rule of law, there could very well be uh, another impeachment effort. Okay, well look, we've overrun significantly and I'm really sorry to those whose questions haven't been taken. I'm afraid this happens every time we have more questions um, than our speakers have time to answer. But um, I think we've had a fantastic session with some really interesting uh, questions and some very stimulating answers. And we still don't know who's going to win. I, I get the sense that the majority of people on the call would prefer Joe Biden to win, but I'm not going to speak for everybody in saying that. Um, um, you really helped us to understand what's going on. And it's good to get a sense from, from the ground in the United States, from people who have asked questions from the States, but particularly from you, Jim, and you, Lisa, who are obviously immersed in this and have been throughout your professional lives. It's been a great privilege to listen to you. Um, thank you both very much for joining us. And thank you to all, all the members of the Wadham Society who've joined. We um, completely depend on your support, um, your friendship, um, particularly at this difficult time for the college. And we're very grateful to you for coming this evening, but also for your messages of support over the last few months and for the material support which many of you have given, which is particularly important to us uh, at the moment. Uh, at the time of this pandemic, we are particularly concerned to maintain um, our determination to open the college up to the kids from marginalised and alienated communities. Um, and as I've said to alumni on many occasions since I've been warden, we've seen in recent years the price of marginalization and alienation and we've been discussing some of that price today and it's a pretty hefty one so thank you thank you for your support thank you for joining and do come back and see us as soon as it's safe to do so which i hope will be sometime not too long after christmas thank you all for joining us and thank you lissa thank you jim